Bit of a dark episode of AEW Dynamite last night, I'm sure you'll agree. Um, it's a bit uncomfortable for me to talk about this, but as you will have seen, they did depict actually, um, you know, a casualty on the show, a homicide, if you will. Um, and I just think in these times, it's really inappropriate to do so. So I don't really know what else to say, but I hope you'll all join me in observing a brief moment of silence for the memory of Vanguard One. Hey everyone, it's Jack from Coldaholic.com and it's time to talk about another exciting edition of AEW Dynamite as we hurtle down the road towards Double or Nothing. This was the penultimate episode of Dynamite before the show itself and this episode really set up a lot of things that we're going to see at the pay-per-view. So uh, lots of interesting stuff to talk about, lots of interesting grades to dish out as well because as we all know that is the one and only way to decide how good a show it is by, by assigning each individual segment a lovely individual grade. So without any further ado let's take a look at all of last night's action. It's time for AEW Dynamite Graded. We open the show with Lance Archer just kicking some poor random guy's ass out of the entrance on his way down to the ring, as he so often does. He is tailed, of course, by Jake the Snake Roberts, who grabs a mic and cuts a promo. He says that he'll apologize to Brandy Rhodes as soon as she kisses his ass. Jake then launches straight into a promo from the 1860s or so, saying that women are best at home in the kitchen, or he makes some kind of weird sexual joke as well saying that he watches Lance Archer's matches. I think the implication is to get him excited before relations occur. It's a weird promo, but it, because it's Jake the Snake and he's just so despicable and so evil, it kind of it kind of works in a way. Luckily, it is interrupted before it goes entirely off the rails by a revving engine. And who's that on the horizon? Why, it's Stone Cold Steve. It's not. It's Cody Rhodes. Yes, Cody is in full rebellious, anarchistic breaking stuff baby face mode because he's really angry because Lance Archer and Jake Roberts assaulted his wife last week so it all makes sense but uh, right okay let's let's dig into this right so let's all just right let's pretend this is drama class right let's all just get ourselves into character right you are Cody Rhodes right you're the stud of this promotion you're the golden boy everyone loves you uh, but your wife has been attacked by the big monster heel and his old veteran horrible manager. So what do you do in that situation? Do you turn up just full of righteous fury, maybe with a weapon, maybe like a baseball bat or something, and just attempt to harm this man in any way you can? Or do you turn up in your perfectly personalized American Nightmare truck with perfectly personalized American Nightmare headrests and lightly tap the barricade after revving the engine for oh, about 20 seconds and then getting out and then trying to start a brawl. I mean, I, I'd do the first one, but I'm, I'm not a wrestler. But Cody does have his fists all taped up and he does, you know, he does bring the intensity to this brawl. It was more just the setup of the segment that I didn't agree with. The brawl goes back and forth for a little bit with Jake Roberts providing weird, creepy commentary over the live mic in his hand from the apron. Uh, it kind of works though, I, I guess. And it looks as though Lance Archer's gonna destroy Cody, but Cody just keeps on ducking out, finding a counter, just toughing it out. And eventually Lance Archer is forced to retreat with Jake saying to him, not now, save this for the match. This gets a B grade from me, but it should have been higher, shouldn't it? Uh, it felt like they really wanted to manufacture this wild and crazy start to the show with the baby face turning up full of vengeance to try and get one over on the heel that he hates so much and with good reason. But instead, it didn't quite click for me in that way. And even at the end of the segment, when Jake's dragging Lance Archer away, I would have liked to have seen Cody just not even let them go, just pursue them and keep trying to get revenge for those dastardly actions of the week before. But instead, that's not what happened. And as such, it only gets a B grade. It was still fine, but not as good as it should have been. Next up, a bloody lovely feel-good babyface tag team match between two bloody lovely feel-good babyface teams of bloody lovely boys. Whoa. It's the best friends, Chuck Taylor and Trent, taking on Jurassic Express. Great to see Jungle Boy and Luchasaurus back on our screens. And the good vibes aren't just being felt by us at home either. They're being felt by the wrestlers themselves, or should I say the, the wrestlers accompanying the tag teams to the ring, as Marco Stunt just decides to chill with Orange Cassidy on the apron for a bit. And that's a tag team that I now desperately want to see. And it would maybe cause Jim Cornette some serious health issues. So maybe it's best if 
for everyone's safety if we don't book that quite yet. And we're going through the motions. It's a pretty enjoyable match. You know, the best friends do their hug on the outside after they've taken control, but Jungle Boy cuts off the hug with a running tope over the top rope. It's all looking pretty exciting. There's double team moves here and there, but on the whole, it just kind of feels like a normal match, which is fine, but again, I wanted a bit more. And then, everything just kicked off at once. The best friends take control of the match again, and Orange Cassidy's setting up on the ramp, at the top of the ramp, for something. We don't quite know what it is, and we'll never know, because before he can do whatever he's planning, he might have just been about to run and hug one of his teammates. He gets wiped out by this insane spinning kick from none other than Phoenix. Also wonderful to see him back, and boy, did he punctuate his arrival. Because this was like an insane spinning kick that you'd see in a Bruce Lee film or something, this understandably takes everyone's attention away from the match itself, including the referees. That allows MJF to jump the crowd barricade and throw Jungle Boy into the ring post. Jungle Boy is thrown back in the ring, he's all dazed, he's in no shape to continue the match, Chuck Taylor puts him away with the awful waffle, and the best friends pick up the win. But it's not over yet, it all just continues to kick off as we cut to the outside of the ring where Wardlow, massive Wardlow, has a hold of Marco stunt tiny compact Marco stunt and just like Brock Lesnar and Zach Gowan or something just launches him into the side of the crowd barrier and it's really it, oh it looks sore this match and the post match a little bit as well gets a B plus grade ironically it was kind of the opposite of the opening segment the opening segment wanted to be all wild and chaotic but couldn't quite manage it whereas this was what appeared to be a first a normal standard tag team match which devolved into absolute lovely enjoyable carnage nice stuff Next up, four-way action in the women's division as Hikaru Shida takes on Chris Statlander, Penelope Ford, and Dr. Britt Baker DMD. The two baby faces in the match, Chris Statlander and Hikaru Shida, strike up a bit of an unofficial alliance for a while against the heels. I feel like we've seen those two team up in multi-woman matches before, but I might be mistaken. And it kind of works as well. It saves Hikaru Shida's day, at least early on, because she gets clamped in the lockjaw from Britt Baker, but Chris Statlander's on hand to grab Britt Baker's nose, her recently damaged nose, remember, and just yank her out of the submission. It's effective. There are, unfortunately, a few little miscommunications, slightly missed time spots here and there, often between Ikara Shida and Britt Baker, and that does seem to affect the other women in the match as well, because we get a really scary moment with a poison rana from Penelope Ford on Chris Stallander, resulting in a nasty landing for Chris, and it doesn't look pretty. Of course, Kip Sabian gets involved because it's a Penelope Ford match, and when there's a Kip Sabian match, Penelope Ford gets involved. You know what I'm saying here, they can't keep their hands off each other, literally, in this match as well, because Sabian gets on the apron, right, and he's holding Ikara Shida in place. Penelope Ford runs at her, she moves, and you think that, I mean, in a normal situation, the heel would run into their ally and then Sabian would like fall out of the ring and everyone would go, hooray, Sheeta got one over on you, you cheeky little chappies. In those words exactly is what they'd say. Instead, Sheeta moves, Penelope Ford runs into Kip Sabian, they just start kissing. They're just making out all over the place. And then Akara Sheeta predictably boots them both in the head because you don't just stop wrestling a match to kiss your fiance. Have some decorum, please. Sheeta drops Penelope Ford with a big backbreaker, running knee strike, one, two, three, and Sheeta wins the match. Now I know what you're thinking, where were the other two women? Why did they not try and break it up? Well, that's because Britt Baker decided that winning the match wasn't actually that important. What was more important was dishing out punishment to Chris Statlander, who she had clamped in the lockjaw on the outside for just a long time. Like throughout the whole finishing sequence, even after the bell, Britt Baker's a dirty heel, and it's it's pretty great. Sheeta stares down at Nyla Rose, the AEW Women's Champion in the front row, and it's later revealed that they will face off a double or nothing in a no DQ, no count out match. It's also later revealed that Britt Baker, DMD, and Chris Stallander will also face off, although I don't think that one's got a stipulation. Unfortunately, I can only give this one a B minus. It should have probably been a touch better, but there were a few sloppy moments and one very scary moment, and hopefully Chris Statlander is okay. At first as well, when watching this match, I thought, oh, this feels a little bit like filler, but we are getting off the back of it, a title shot at, at an upcoming pay-per-view, and a feud between a dentist and an alien, which sounds just totally WWF New Generation era, doesn't it? Next up, tag team action as Kenny Omega and Matt Hardy try to bounce back from their hilarious loss in that no DQ backstage brawl type thing from last week. Uh, taking on the proud and powerful. The heels beat down Kenny Omega as he makes his entrance and just, you know, deal with him in the ring. Then Matt Hardy's music hits. Santana runs up to the stage to try and cut him off as well. Matt Hardy gets the better of him and bites him. And as whenever he bites him, pyro goes off. Flames shoot out of the stage. <laughs> 
I don't know what analysis to give here. He bit him and they synced that with flames and fire coming out of the floor. Wrestling. This was a strange contrast from the last match, which was a very ambitious match, but sometimes things went a bit wrong. In this match, nothing really went wrong, but it wasn't as ambitious a match, I feel. It was a little bit more slow paced. They stuck to the basics, which is totally fine, but yeah, it was a bit of a change of pace that we had to adjust to as an audience. After quite a long match, in fairness, the faces look like they're about to take home the win, with Matt Hardy clamping on like a butterfly submission kind of thing with his legs wrapped around Ortiz's waist and he's trying to pull him down to the canvas and choke him out. And Ortiz does almost get choked out. He's fading really fast. But here to save the day, comes just a banged up Sammy Guevara. I mean, Sammy did get run over last week, so it does kind of make sense that he'd be feeling it for the next few days, but he is totally hamming it up. It's hilarious. He's got a neck brace on. He's limping down to the ring. He's got a steel chair. He gets in the ring. He's about to hit Matt Hardy with the chair, but obviously he's in no physical condition to fight, so Matt Hardy just kicks the chair out of his hands. Matt then spikes Sammy Guevara with a twist of fate, which Sammy sells like Rob Van Dam, just like straight onto his head, which looks nasty, but effective. And the baby faces really look like they're gonna win now. And they do, of course they do. I was worried for a second that they weren't gonna, and that Matt Hardy and Kenny Omega would lose their second match in a row and be the worst tag team in AEW history, but it's fine, it's all okay. With Matt Hardy securing the win with an elevated twist of fate from kind of the middle rope, I think. It was different, I liked it. This gets a B grade, perfectly enjoyable stuff, a lot of great character work going on here, as you'd expect given the four men involved, but maybe not as good as I thought it would be. Like if you brought those names to me and said Santana and Ortiz are going to have a match against Kenny Omega and Matt Hardy, I'd be like, wow, this could be an insane match, worthy of a pay-per-view. Instead, what we got was a little bit more run-of-the-mill, but it was, it was totally fine. Just a brief little bit backstage that's too short to grade really, but Taz is Taz explaining to Darby Allen what wrestling is and what he did wrong when he lost to Cody. And Darby gets sick of it and goes, Taz, I know. I was once the third ranked amateur in the state of Idaho. So screw you, dad. And then he storms off to his room. I may have made up those last two little bits there. But I get Darby Allen's pain, I understand, because sometimes you don't need to mention your achievements. You don't need to always bring up the fact that you were the third top point scorer in the Tyne and Weir under 16's basketball league. And yes, it was 12 years ago or so, but that doesn't matter. It was still an important achievement and you should be proud of me, but it's fine. I don't, it's fine. I don't care. And in another little backstage segment that again is too short to grade, Hikaru Shida's being in interviewed about being the number one contender. She's really excited for the match. Nyla Rose shows up and just bops her in the head with her own kendo stick, the indignity. That is followed by a squash match featuring MJF and Lee Johnson. Obviously MJF picks up the easy victory. I'm, I'm gonna give this a B minus grade, which is high for a squash match, but let me explain why. The reason is that MJF is just really good in this role as he is at so many different you know, avenues of being a heel. And one of those is a squash match over a really outmatched opponent. He's talking trash to the baby faces in the front row. He's slapping his opponent. He's giving him little kicks on the floor. It's just lovely, hateable stuff. After the match, MJF gets on the mic and cuts a promo on Jungle Boy, who of course he is facing a double or nothing, but he wants a tune up fight first and has managed to secure one against Marco Stunt next week. Come on, Marco, you can do it. Marco's gonna lose. Next up, the match that we've all been waiting for. That's not sarcasm, like literally, there's been so much hype for this match uh, just because it's been built really well and really organically. Chris Jericho taking on Suge D, AKA Sugar Dunkerton, AKA Pineapple Pete. It's great seeing Sugar Dunkerton get pyro and everything after all his years of service in the wrestling business, both in the US independent scenes and more recently in the UK independent scene as well. He's just, He's just great, and he seems like a lovely guy too. But obviously the match wasn't gonna last very long. Um, I mean, Jericho is out with all of his boys, his entire posse around him. He's just wearing a Pineapple Pete t-shirt, ironically. He's wearing his opponent's merch, which is another level of disrespect. Um, Sugar Dunkerton gets quite a lot of offense in for about 30 to 40 seconds, and it's really exciting for a little while, but then Jericho hits the Judas Effect back elbow and picks up the, the Pretty obvious win. But then things go down because Jericho gets on the mic and this is where this segment just took off and was one of my favorite segments of the week. Um, Jericho gets on the mic and challenges the elite to a stadium stampede match for double or nothing. By the sounds of it, it seems like it's gonna be like last week's street fight, but on a much bigger scale. It's gonna be in the Jacksonville Jaguars stadium. And I can't wait to see what insane spots they manufacture for this one. Vanguard one arrives, flies down into the ring, to uh, accept the challenge on behalf of the elite. And they, as I mentioned in the intro, they destroy him. They literally take him apart. Those vicious inner circle assholes have 
have killed a, a drone, a man, a drone, a drone man. And then to complete the comedy, Matt Hardy comes out and he's like, no, he's like fully heartbroken, as we all are, that Vanguard 1 has perished. This gets an A- minus grade from me. The whole Sugar Dunkerton Pineapple Pete thing was really nicely built to, and I know the match only lasted a minute or so, but it was a genuinely nice moment for fans of Sugar Dunkerton, such as myself. Uh, also, Really excited for that Stadium Stampede match. I think that's going to be off the chain, as the cool kids said in 1991. And also, I thought that the whole Vanguard 1 thing was hilarious too. And maybe we'll be seeing Vanguard 2 show up in the near future. That's just my prediction. But now that I've said it, it sounds very likely. They run down the lineup for next week on commentary before our main event and just slip in there that Mike Tyson is going to be presenting the TNT Championship to the winner of the Cody vs. Archer match at Double or Nothing. What? What? So yeah, not a lot of time to process that mind-blowing news, but check out Tom Campbell's news video on the channel to see what it was all about. And now let's talk about the main event, Christopher Daniels taking on Mr. Brody Lee. Brody is out wearing the title with all of his minions around him, especially Ten, the big lad, the one who's like his special chosen one henchman. And Brody Lee gets the ring announcer to call him the self-proclaimed AEW World Champion. You're not the champion, Brody Lee. You're a very naughty boy. On commentary at one stage as well, uh, by the way, I enjoy this match, but on commentary at one stage, I have to mention, I think Tony Schiavone mixes up Brody Lee and Lance Archer, mixes up two of the big hosses of the promotions roster because he says, oh, I hate Brody Lee. He's always beating up some poor guy on the way to the ring during his entrance. And I'm thinking, no, he's not. That's a different person entirely. It's kind of like if JR was like, you know what? I absolutely love Chuck Taylor. I love the way that he is from the Jurassic period and he's 65 billion years old. It's kind of like that in a way, isn't it? It's not as bad as that. Brody Lee dominates most of this match, obviously, but Christopher Daniels starts to turn the tide and take the upper hand because he's Christopher Daniels. He's awesome as hell. So then big boy number 10 gets on the apron to try and intervene, but SCU jump the barricade, Kazarian and Scorpio Sky, they pull him down, they start brawling on the outside, this distracts the referee, so Brody gets a steel chair, runs at Daniels, but he gets a foot up, kicks the chair back into his face, grabs it, and just waffles him over the head. I think Brody Lee got his hands up, but over the head. I think he got his hands up. Daniels gets the Koji clutch locked in, so here come the rest of the minions to try and save their leader. But here come Scorpio Sky and Frankie Kazarian into the ring now. The two guys in the match don't get touched. It doesn't get called off. And they're joined by Cole Cabana for some reason. He's there as well. Boom, boom. Go Cole, being a good baby face. And they chase the minions away. Daniels hits the Angel's wings. One. Brody Lee kicks out. Oh no. Daniels hits the best moonsault ever. One, two. Brody Lee kicks out. Bit later on, Discus Lariat. And my boy Christopher Daniels unfortunately loses. It's the right call, but I'm sad about it. But I'm not sad for too long because here comes John Moxley and he is angry after the events of last week. And he wants his belt back, the physical title belt, which Brody Lee takes as he bails, literally throwing his minions at John Moxley to keep him at bay. Moxley deals with them, hits a paradigm shift on one of them, grabs a mic and cuts a, you know, and I'll get you and I'll see you at the pay-per-view promo to close the show. This gets an A- minus grade, really enjoyed it. The match was good. Daniel's performance was superb as per usual. He is ageless. And Moxley was really intense at the end, implying that Brody Lee's career might end before it's even really began. His AW career, he's been wrestling for longer. I'm not stupid. So overall, I'm gonna give the show a B plus grade. I thought as a show, on its own merit, it wasn't the most spectacular, but in terms of being a setup show to a pay-per-view down the line, I think that was a really good effort from AEW this week. Nothing overly flashy, nothing wild like the brawl from last week, but a really enjoyable show and one which will hopefully serve its purpose in about 10 days time. Thanks very much for watching. I've been Jack from Coldaholic. Nine days time, what an idiot. I've been Jack from Coldaholic.com. Let me know what you thought about the show in the comments section down below, and I'll see you very soon.